So it's six. It's now six eleven. It looks like we've got um, a good number of people uh, in the chat. I want to say hi. I'm Barkley. I'm I'm not Amy, even though my name tag says Amy. Um, I'm Barkley Rafferty. I'm one of the newish owners of the Garden District Bookshop, and we are absolutely thrilled today to host um, James Lee Burke and Colette Bancroft to discuss. James Lee Burke's newest book, Another Kind of Eden. Um, we, uh, I unfortunately have not had the pleasure of meeting you in person, but I've heard many, many stories about the many, many events that you did here um, over the years. And we're just, I know Britain's on here somewhere listening, um, but we're just so happy to even have you on Zoom um, and to celebrate your new book. So just to give everybody a little bit of a rundown, we are on a webinar. We're not on a regular Zoom call. We would love for you to type in questions as you have them. I will field them and uh, and uh, focus them back to our participants um, at the end of their discussion. I am sure that they will have a lively discussion. And right now, I'd like to introduce um, Colette Bancroft from the Tampa Bay Times to talk about this new creation. So, Colette, there you go. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, it's always, always a pleasure and a privilege to talk to James Lee Burke, who I have uh, called a national treasure in print several times. And I stand by that estimation. He's, uh, I think, one of, the, one of the best American writers today. And I'm not gonna, you know, best, I'm not gonna say best American crime fiction writers because you know, why draw lines about genre? He's one of the best American yeah. fiction writers, I think, writing today. This is, Jim, I think this is your 41st book. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Um, most of those novels and the novels that most people are familiar with and, and the series in which he's written the most books, of course, are the ones about Dave Robichaux. And, yes. uh, and we're, we're, we're talking through the good graces of a bookstore in Dave Robichaud's uh, longtime turf. Um, he's not all of those books are set in New Orleans, but uh, but but New Orleans sort of imbues those books in a lot of ways. Uh, yeah. Dave complete. Uh, but the book we're talking about tonight is related to a different series of your books, mm -hmm. the Holland books, which are. Um, sort of westerns but that's that's they sort of expand that label um and and this book this is set it's set in the west of course but uh the main character in this book aaron holland broussard uh about five years ago you finished a trilogy of novels uh let me get them in the right order wayfaring stranger the House of the Rising Sun, and The Jealous Kind. And that's a trilogy about uh, the Holland family that you have called, and I think you're probably right, um, your best books that you think are your best books. And, and they, that trilogy had a kind of sense of completeness, you know, with The Jealous Kind, that you were telling this story that arced across a century almost. But now you've brought Aaron back. Um, what, what made you feel you had more of his story to tell in another kind of Eden? We come back to him in the first, in the, the jealous kind, he's a teenager. This book is 10 years later, roughly. I, I really don't know, to tell you the truth. I, I guess I was, oh, disturbed by some of the events that have been taking our, uh, place around us for the last three or four years. And I have always felt that the past is the issue. We have to look at the past in order to understand the present. And I've always thought that 1962 was the year that was became a portal, that we went into another era. And of course, it was the era of John Kennedy, at first a very optimistic one, but it's also the beginnings of... Uh, Oh, militarism and neocolonialism, and of course the upshot was the uh, 
who uh, 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 golly Moses, the uh, Cuban cr uh, uh, missile uh, right. yeah. situation, and we. I, I don't. Even, I, I still today. I, I have a hard time talking about it because I think it was so dangerous. We have no idea how close we came to it. Uh, it, it we came within two hours. Mm -hmm. The two hours before John Kennedy told the troops they are uh, they were loading, going over the gun rolls into these uh, <clears throat> LSTs or something like them. But he addressed the uh, United States electorate three weeks after the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. And these were his words. This is a literal quote. Victory would, would have been ashes in our mouths. And then he went on and said that within a month, 185 million Americans would have died. And that would be just for starters. Mm -hmm. And he rolled the dice anyway. We never talk about it anymore. No. I'll tell you, I lived at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. I was 10 years old. And we lived in Tampa next door to the Air Force Base where Strike Command was located. And we were one of the top targets. And, yeah. and I remember being evacuated during the Cuban Missile mm -hmm. Crisis. And of course, I had no idea what was going on. But it was terrifying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, the story, though, has some interesting characters in it and a love affair. Also has to do with the migrant farm workers. Mm -hmm. And it has a great deal to do with the people who actually grow our food. And it's about Woody Guthrie's people. Remember mm -hmm. what Woody said in his ballad, pastures of plenty. We come with the dust and we go with the wind. And those are my characters in this yes. book. Yes. Also, the story goes into some historical accounts, uh, namely the <clears throat> Ludlow uh, massacre took place about 15 miles from Trinidad. And Trinidad is the center of the story. Yeah. Incredible. But it's about people on the drift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Aaron, by the time this book starts, he's he's been in and out of the service. He served in Korea, which has had a huge impact on him. And then he's gone. He's he's gone to school and he's written a novel that he says has been rejected by every publisher in New York. And he sort of leaves yeah. that life behind him. And and, and he's he's, you know, jumping on freight trains and riding, you know, like the, kind of the, the old, you know, rail hobo, railroad hobo. And, and he comes to, and gets a job with those people um, on a farm on this, in this beautiful setting in Colorado. Um, and at first it seems like he's in Eden, you know, because the country's so beautiful and the, there are these characters, Cotton, uh, Cotton Williams, although Cotton shares yeah. a first name with another Cotton who wasn't such a nice guy, Cotton Mather, that Puritan fellow, and that's sort of one, I'll come back to that, but that's kind of one of the hints of something that's going on in this book, but um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about Cotton, because he's a, he's an important character, I think. Well, the main character, the narrator, of course, is Aaron Holland Roussard, who, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, is an educated man who's a misfit. Uh, he has no explanation for the kind of life he lives, other than he got fired as an academic mm -hmm. and has a very shaky employment record. But... Uh, the people around him have an extraordinary story. One that's more extraordinary than his, even. And Cotton was a ranger. And I, I worked with this man. He's, I worked with this man, the real Cotton. Mm -hmm. He was a U.S. ranger and a paratrooper, of course. And when the GIs went into Rome, 1943, the Germans pulled out. They headed for the Po Valley to the north. But the Waffen SS, the really bad people, the apotheosis of people, they went down in the catacombs. And this man I worked with said there were three levels down there. And he said on the third level, 
there was a passageway that went from St. Sebastian's Cathedral all the way to a room underneath the obelisk in front of the Vatican. And that's where those Waffen SS made their stand. And these GIs had to dig them out of there. And the friend I worked with told me what happened. He said, in this room, there's terrible odor because of the stagnant waters, 2,000 years of water down there. Mm -hmm. And he said it was coal black. And he, he could see tracer rounds going, hitting on the rocks around them. And he said, in that room were the caskets of St. Paul and St. Peter. And so here are the remains of the founders of Christianity. And these GIs, 19, 20, 21 years old, uh, kids from Flatbush or Iowa, or, you know, San Fran, uh, kids who come from working class uh, backgrounds, and these are not professional soldiers. They're pitted against probably the best soldiers in the world who take away their inhumanity. Right. And he had a <clears throat> one of these grease guns, paratroopers, where it has a folding stock. And as as occurred, uh, <clears throat> well, this is how I I I interpreted things. None of those Waffen SS came out of our friend Cotton Williams blows them out of their socks and they're, they're a group that needed to move on to wherever bad guys like this go. And I hope they all got their hazmat suits, asbestos suits. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Cotton tells this story and he's been through that, but he's he's it's it's a it's a story that he's he doesn't brag about he doesn't oh. boast about it's a it's an experience that turned him against violence in yeah. a lot of ways um mm -hmm. or made him retreat from yeah. that yeah. yeah but this is the story it's the story yeah. of america yeah it's the story of what he does to these people that's that but it's also the story of nathaniel harthard's mm -hmm. people Yes. And it's in the first, it's in the first page. It's on the first page. Yes. That the ink that tells this story could have come from the ink and the yes. pen of Nathaniel Hawthorne. Yes. Not one, I, I, and bless all the reviewers have been quite kind to my work, but nobody has mentioned that first page. Oh, I did. The Puritans I did. Still, you did. Okay. <laughs> in fact, I quoted. But, okay. Right. And I wanted to ask you about it. Let me ask you about it because because I think I think it's a bold move to compare your own book to Nathaniel Hawthorne, one of the founding fathers of American literature. But you make the book makes the case that you're right mm -hmm. to do that. But I wonder, and 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 you're right. His 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 work, and especially Young Goodman Brown, which you which you invoke, it. it it's. It, it, it's, it wafts through this whole book, the the quality of that story and the, the tale of the young man who goes out to meet the devil, essentially. And I wonder whether in writing the book, whether you were thinking about that, about the Hawthorne story from the beginning, or whether those things started to emerge mm -hmm. as you wrote the book. Yeah, I, uh, that story, uh, Young Goodman Brown, has had an influence on me since mm -hmm. I started writing. You know, yeah. I, was, an amazing I published story. my first story when I was 19. Mm -hmm. But that's it. Young Goodman Brown uh, becomes a careless man, and he thinks that he can outwit, outthink the devil. Mm -hmm. And he's going to, and to challenge him yeah. there in the woods. And he discovers that you do not challenge evil because it will subsume you. And that's the theme of the book. Yeah. That's the theme of the book. And the last scenes take place in the Christe, uh, Christe de Sangre Mountains, the Blood of Christ Mountains, which are over there uh, going west and uh, toward going west and toward uh, the other side of 
kind of yeah 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 that's where Colorado is a magical place oh, it's incredible wow. yeah beautiful yeah well setting is always important in your books and yeah yeah uh, um to come back to Aaron, the main character, um, it seems to me that he has, this was true in, in The Jealous Kind, and it seems even more apparent in this book, that he has some things in common with Dave Robichaux, that they both kind of struggle with moral, you know, clarity, with doing, do, wanting to do the right thing, that, but they both really also struggle to control rage. They both have blackout rages, mm -hmm. which result in bad things. And the third thing they, they have in common, it seems to me, is kind of small r romanticism. That is, they fall in love easily, and they fall in love fast and hard, and that doesn't always turn out well. <laughs> So I wonder if you could talk about, you know, if whether whether you see a relationship between those two characters and uh, and what it means to you. Well, uh, Aaron um, falls in love with this young woman from Texas. She's a 19 year old waitress who uh, is a very compassionate person. She's also obsessed with the fate of the poor people who were murdered by John Rockefeller's goons and the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, Colorado militia in two, uh, 1914. And yeah. they died in the cellar. And I've been down that cellar many times. And <clears throat> the first time I went down there, just, I, I was sure it was haunted. I just felt it. There were, I think, nine children who died and maybe three uh, women. But uh, <clears throat> it was a terrible thing that occurred. And there was never any justice there for the miners. They never got their union. They never did. One of the Rockefellers, one of the sons, came down and danced with the miner's wife. Someone said, a newsman, uh, he danced with the miner's wife, but the miners did not get their union. But anyway, this, what I'm saying is that the, the struggle that took place there in that flat place, that flat place, it looks, it looks like this cannon smoke always hanging over it in the morning, you know. Uh, it's still there, you know, and yeah. the, the haves and the have-nots. And people can say, well, what's new about the class war? I got news for them. It's, it's always been there. And it's yeah. never been mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And my and 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 you said that this kind of haunts Joanne, the woman that the young woman he falls yeah. in love with. And yeah. and she's a painter, she's an artist. And when he yeah. sees the paintings, she's sort of hesitant to show them. But when he sees them, she says that she's sort of trying to paint those victims, those people who died in the Ludlow massacre. And, and I think she says, free them in some way or, or bring them some kind of recognition or justice. Is that, do you think maybe what you're doing too in, in writing about it, that, 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 yes. this, that your art can, can do a similar thing? Yeah. Yes, I, I, I believe that's what art does. It gives voice to people who have not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what Woody Gatsby did, Cisco Houston, Pete Seeger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're following in their footsteps. Yeah. Well, they're pretty good guys. Yeah. They, yeah. <laughs> good footsteps to follow. Arlen Guthrie and Sarah. Sarah was a beautiful voice. You ever hear Sarah Guthrie, Sarah Guthrie sing Union Woman? Boy. Oh, hey. Yeah. You'll never forget that if you mm -hmm. her rendition of Union mm -hmm. yep. And Woody wrote the song. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, can't scare me. I'm sticking with the Union. <laughs> That's the refrain. Yep. <laughs> and Aaron gets in trouble, uh, gets beaten up without even 
meaning to because he's driving a truck that unbeknownst to him has a UAW United or UFW United Farm Workers bumper sticker. United Farm Workers bumper yeah. sticker so pulls he, into a beer joint full of thugs. Yep. <laughs> so he, he, he sort of, he sort of Basically so. inside without even meaning to, but that draws him into that experience, yeah. draws him into yeah. that conflict and, and makes him aware yeah. of it because he wasn't partic all that aware of it before. But, but it, it seems to me that there's a kind of interweaving of that, that, th that thread of American violence and that thread of American class tension that that come together in the book mm -hmm. yeah well uh it is it's a, a book that oh goes places that my other work has not perhaps a private cathedral maybe right. but it goes even farther yeah and, and the original title of the book was the pillars of heaven because mm -hmm. Aaron felt in the early pages of the book that he had found Eden. It was the perfect place. This was the agrarian society that uh, Thomas Jefferson envisioned. You know, he was an incurable romantic about agriculture. Mm -hmm. But and he discovers, though, that things are not what they seem. And there's a presence there from Salem. Massachusetts that he ignores. Yes, yes, yeah, that he in fact goes to work for. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but you see, evil is always in the background. We get the story of Cotton Williams. He's, it's told to us and he has a bad eye. He has an eye that is all white. It looks like mm -hmm. the uh, skin on a hard boiled egg, a peeled right. hard boiled egg. Mm -hmm. And when and Aaron looks at him, it's just, it's like he's looking at two faces as though yeah. it's cut in half. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, yeah. But also, uh, we discover that uh, the, the educational system there, which we depend upon, and that was one of the, the, the virtues of the Puritans. When the Puritans arrived in a particular piece of geography, First thing they did was build a church. Second thing was always a school. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, and of course they gave us our work ethic, but they also had a way of legitimizing the murder, the mass murder and hanging of their friends, their best friends, with the mass hanging and other things, pressing their neighbors to death with stones, like Giles Corley. You know, yeah. was pressed to death by stones, I, and they tried to make him confess that he was witch, a witch. And mm -hmm. one of the one of the tormentors had this big stone and said, "Giles, will you admit you're a witch? Why will you not speak? Speak to me." And Giles Corey said, "More weight." Mm -hmm. That's such a great, such a great line. That's, and that's the kind of guy Aaron is. And we meet a police officer, Sheriff's Department. His name is Benbo, Wade Benbo, and he's heck on wheels. He first seems like pretty mean hombre, but he's a real decent guy who was there at the liberation of Dachau. I've known three people who were there at the same time. My friend, uh, Charlie Williford, you know, crime writer. Oh, yeah. I know. Great writer. Miami. Oh, he was, and he was a great guy. He was at Dachau. So, so was uh, Lester Hemingway, and so was my cousin, whose name was Weldon uh, Weldon Benbo uh, Millet, and he is the main character. He's the character. I'm probably, I'm probably not, I shouldn't be talking about. Uh, that's nothing but trouble. But, uh, forget I said all that. <laughs> the point is. I knew three people who were there and they were never the same again by their own admission. Mm -hmm. And that's what Wade uh, Bimbo says in, <clears throat> Wade Bimbo says in the book, he says these poor devils, these men who survived or women who survived Dachau, 
would hold on to the GI's arms or the clothing. They wouldn't let go of them. They were afraid the Americans would go away when the Waffen SS would come back. Mm -hmm. They were so frightened. Yeah. Because the, the, what the, the Nazis did uh, has uh, no peer. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like it in human history. It was Camus who said that. Yeah. He said, uh, future governments might equal the evil of Adolf Hitler, but they will never surpass it. Yeah. And so he and Sartre and all those guys were, uh, they were mixed up with the underground, you know. And, and right. Tell, right. Sartre not so much, but Camus was. He was yeah. in the underground. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Aaron encounters evil on a much smaller scale, at least, mm -hmm. than, than Dachau. But still, you, in this book, you've always had elements in your book that were um, beyond realism, that whether it's, you know, whatever you want to call it, elements of the supernatural or magic realism or, or anything like, things like that, going back to in the mist with the Confederate dead and all of those books, you've always, and especially in a private cathedral with that really terrifying character, Gideon, uh, that Robichaud has to uh, confront. And in this book, you really sort of pull the curtain back altogether that, that the book becomes almost a, a, a kind of cross between a nightmare and a fable i'm not sure what exactly to call it but it 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 goes it goes into that other world um more completely i think than than any of your other books and and what made you what made you choose to do that well it's a hard subject to go into because once you get there uh you're left with somehow explaining why people do the things, the terrible things that they do. What is it? And I, this is what a private cathedral is about, the Dave Robert, last Dave Robichaud book. Uh, in the first chapter of a private cathedral, he visits the Texas State Penitentiary to question a psychopath with whom he grew up. And I don't want to give away the story. But Dave is there because he has never understood the evil that is in some people mm -hmm. and the behavioral explanations for it just don't add up. It's, it's, uh, it, 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 it's not commiserate with... Yeah, at a uh, certain level, it's not explainable. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't know. Look, there's a. My father believed that there were different uh, ancestors. Our, our gene pool is not one. It's it's uh, several. There are more than uh, one. There's more than one uh, seminal situation. And my father said it's just there are just certain people there who probably maybe it, they were part man. I don't want I don't want to offend the Neanderthals. <laughs> They've actually gotten <laughs> some good press in the Neanderthals on the on the floor. <laughs> and that has a club on his shoulder, furrowed brow, you know, his recessed marbles for eyes. I don't know if I really want to claim. <laughs> I know this 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 book. I'm sorry. But that's certainly <laughs> the issue that you deal with in this book, and that you deal with in most of the Robishow books, is that kind of unexplainable evil. You know, it's not yeah. uh, it's not the the bad behavior of somebody who you know robs a bank. It's the kind of evil that we like dock out that we can't explain yeah. or comprehend. Yeah, can't and explain. It. Kind of tries to no. or looks at yeah. it. Not. Yeah. 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 Well, let me, I think we're going to have questions. I think we have questions. And since we started a little late, I don't want to cut that short. But let me ask you one more thing. Um, actually, two more things. What are you working on? What's your next book? 
And also, do you ever, it's not that I want you to do this at all, but do you ever think about retiring? No retirement, no, no, uh, no, I've never, I, I cannot imagine not being a writer. I never wanted to do anything other than that. Uh, I finished a book, finished a book I called uh, Every uh, Cloak Rolled in Blood. It's a line from the Bible. Every Cloak Rolled in Blood. It's quite a book. It's very unusual. Uh, it's not a short, it's a short novel. It's not a long story, but it's, I've never, I've never read one like it. That, that's, that sounds vain and self-laudatory, but I, in truth, have never seen a book like it. I don't think anyone has ever written one like it. I don't, I don't claim the, the talent that I'm, I, I perhaps have. I've never took credit for the talent I have. I've always believed it comes from a source outside of themselves. I've also learned this, and I learned it early on. The artist who takes credit for his gift will have that gift taken from him and given to someone else. Well, I think we can all, we can all be happy you have that gift wherever it comes from because it's given a lot, given all of us a great deal of, uh, of pleasure and thought and um, terror too once in a while, but terror in good causes. So. Well, I'm a short gonna... story by Larry, Larry Brown yeah. that, about the artist, the writer, and it's a woman who is a little town in Mississippi, working class people. She's a housewife and she's got this brilliant talent and her husband is a total clod. <laughs> he doesn't know what's happening in his life. His wife is, has people from all over the world calling him up. They're parking in front of his house. What in God's name is going on? <laughs> it's a hilarious story. I'll have to read it. That's that probably is sort of his. That was probably sort of his experience. I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know if you knew Mark Larry Brown. He was a really nice fellow. Yeah, yeah, I never met him, but I know his work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm definitely going to agree with what about, you know, the fact that if you, you know, your talent has, has pleased and, and been welcomed by so many people. And I'm just so thrilled that you two were able to talk to us. We do have some questions. Um, uh, before we get to those questions, I want to shamelessly say that <laughs> this book, um, Another Kind of Eden is available at the Garden District Bookshop in New Orleans. It's available on our website for purchase. And as Jim mentioned earlier, he's noticed that uh, I had a kind of collectible closet behind me. And I briefly turned around while we were talking, while you two were talking, to check out what we have there. And um, I noticed all different types of things, including special anniversary editions of some of your previous works, um, signed books from the Robichaux series, all of these different wonderful things. So if anybody out there is looking for Christmas presents, maybe, um, or holiday <laughs> gifts, or just something for yourself, um, the Garden District Bookshop is a great place to find them. So I'm going to, we have questions both in the chat and in the q and I'm going to start with the Q&A uh, and try to answer this, see what Answer Live does, since I've never done a webinar before. Um, so Susan said, I saw you at the Tennessee Williams Fest many years ago. It was a wonderful presentation. I've always been interested in the Southern Gothic quality of your work. Where do you see yourself in relation to authors like Flannery O'Connor and Walker, Walker Percy? Ooh, well, those are pretty tough competitors to uh, talk about. Uh, Flannery O'Connor was just a tremendous person. I, I didn't know her, but it was obvious. She had great humanity. And I, I think that, uh, there's no one who treated Southern humor, Gothic humor, better than she. She was a master in bringing us characters who just glowed with neurosis. Just people who had 
unicorn horns growing out of their foreheads. <laughs> and she was from, was it Mill Milledgeville, Georgia? Yeah. Is that where she grew up? That's right. And I never understood that. Like all of did her neighbors all look like these characters. And then I met a guy who had been on a Georgia chain gang. This was about 50 years ago. And he was old then. And he was did time in Milledgeville. It said people like him. He, he looked like one of <laughs> Flannery O'Connor's characters said they're all over the place. Uh, I'm probably going to get killed by a big little Millingsville. But Ms. O'Connor, golly, she, but people who have read her know what I'm talking about. And the other, of course, uh, who was the other writer who mentioned? Oh, uh, Walker Percy. He, the gentleman who defined, whose very life defined the genteel American Southern man of letters. You know, it's interesting. Listen to, uh, I knew, uh, I, I knew it, but listen to the accent if you hear a recording. It's the same English or dialect spoken by William Faulkner and Jimmy Carter and Robert Penn Warren. And linguistics call it plantation English. Why is that? Or plantation British? Because in the plantation culture, there were no public schools back then. It's the 19th century. The wealthy people hired British tutors. And so they gave us those peculiar pronunciations. So Jimmy Carter, now, you know, would always, he would use vowels that were as big as a baseball. <laughs> but my father had the same accent. My father was a genteel man. And he could read the phone book and it would sound like a Petrarchan sonnet. <laughs> and Miss, oh yeah, but anyway, I, oh, uh, anyway, Walker Percy was a fine gentleman. I don't want to take up all the time. But anyway, I, uh, called him up once, I didn't know him. Um, LSU Press wanted to get a blurb for my novel, which was rejected by 111, uh, 111 times, The Lost Get Back Boogie. So I called up um, Mr. Uh, uh, Walker at his home, and uh, Walker Percy at his home, and the uh, machine answered it. And this is what he said. Hello, this is Walker Percy talking. If you would please leave your name and your number, I will certainly, as soon as I get home, return your, your, your very kind call. But also I would like to apologize to you that I have forced you into the uncomfortable position of having a conversation with the robot. <laughs> I have a feeling my oh, husband's my in the background. Goodness. I have a feeling that that's going to be my husband's <laughs> new answering machine. <laughs> um, was so, the interview with him in uh, the Atlantic Monthly about the new morality. This was years ago. <laughs> his uncle was his uncle named Charles. I'm his not uncle sure. Was <laughs> anyway, Walker Percy gave all credit for anything he was to his uncle. He said, uh, the, my, my uncle Charles would be somewhat bemused by the fact that the, behave, the, the erotic behavior of poor white trash is now being celebrated as the new, liber, li, the new liberated, uh, anyway, I better not get into this. Anyway, <laughs> anyway. You read, you know, I'm not going to say this on the, well, forget it, but he was really a gentleman, he, and he gave me a great blurb. You know, that I had been out of hardback print for 13 years until LSU Press put me back in business, while with them, and, and Walker Percy helped too. So. Wow, what a, what a kind thing yeah, to do. He was, a, um, he was a nice gentleman. Another question uh, is, is the following. Many of your characters, such as Dave Robichaux, are deeply religious or spiritual. 
even though they have violent tendencies. Do you think that the religious slash spiritual aspect of Dave's character is his way of retaining balance and sanity? Well, I don't know that Jim, uh, I don't know that Dave is religious. I, I would say that he has a spiritual view, but that does not isolate him. I mean, there's no singularity to that fact that anyone who understands the glue of creation has to eventually address certain questions, the nature of God, the existence of God. Uh, it, it doesn't have anything to do with religiosity. It is the essential question. Socrates talks about that. And he says the unexamined life is not worth living. And Dave does address those things. There are people who couldn't care less, and they have, they're have about as interesting as a fire plug. But he, Dave Rover shows, as uh, is, is, is William Wordsworth said, he's a man who is of humble origins, but he thinks and feels deeply. That, those were the terms that uh, William Wordsworth used once talk, when he was talking about using the point of view of humble people who actually are blessed in many ways that wealthy and educated people are not. Why? Because they do not understand pain. They never suffer. And for that reason, they have no empathy. Dave understands pain. It's a great, great answer. Um, yeah. Carol asked if there are any more Dave books in the works and what actor, I know that he's been in film before, but sh her question was at what actor would you like to see portray him in film? Oh, well, number one, I, I don't answer the first question. I, I never plan the books ahead. Uh, number two, uh, oh golly. Um, uh, what was the second question? Um, the second question, so I interjected a little bit of my own thought into this. I know that Dave has been portrayed in film um, a couple of times by oh, two different okay. actors. Yeah. And her, but Carol asked, um, what actor would you like to see portray him in a film? I, w I assume that means moving forward in the future. It, it, it's a, a real tough question because that was always the problem. And there were two very good actors that played him. Uh, Dave Rogan show and uh, one was Alec Baldwin in Heaven's Prisoners and Tommy Lee Jones played the role in In the Electric Mist with Confederate Dead. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, I wrote one screenplay. Uh, it, it never made the, it never made the cut. But <clears throat> the problem I had in portraying the character was same problem everybody has dealing as a script writer with Dave Robichaud. His thoughts are internalized. He doesn't have any signal that he sends to people. He and Clayton Purcell share one commonality, well, more than one, but the, when it comes to the physiology, it's that moment when there's a movement in the eye and there's no wrinkle in the face, but that's the warning. <laughs> Clint, Clint Purcell is the equivalent of a steel wrecking ball with spikes all over it. <laughs> but they're great guys, but they never tip their hand. But they're great guys. Yeah. They're both out of medieval folklore. Cleet is the uh, trickster, and Dave is the egalitarian knight that wears blue denim. Great. Um, let's see, we have some more questions that are coming in, and I love that. Patricia asks, um, she says, I'm trying to click answer live so that it's all recorded together. She says, your book titles are so, po to me, are so poetic. From Neon Rain, Black Cherry Blues, In the Electric Mist of the Confederate Dead, White Dove's Morning, Ten Roof Blowdown, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What is your inspiration for your book titles? What inspires the title? They're always in the book. 
They're in the narration. I always find. I never know it. Maybe once, maybe twice, but maybe not to. I knew what the title would be, but no, it's it's in there. Someplace in there, a character's going to give me the title. That's great. I wonder if, um, I mean, do you do you finish? I mean, this is my question, not Patricia's. Do you finish the book and then go back in there, or do you, as you're writing it, say, like, as it comes out of your brain, say that's the title of the book? Well, that's it. Usually, now uh, I think the one exception was a private cathedral, uh, and my editor uh, had uh, it came from the theme of the book, but I don't think it came literally from the book. But, uh, and then I agreed with it. I forgot the title that I had. This was better. <laughs> that makes perfect sense. Editors have a lot of opinions. Um, Susan, by the way, who, who asked the question about uh, Walker Percy, also made the comment that Uncle Charles was also horrified when Bill Faulkner showed up at his house with no shoes. I wanted to add that in there just so that everyone could hear it. Um, and one more just brief comment before I get to two more questions. Britton Trice, who owned the Garden District Bookshop for 40 plus years, um, was listening to us for a while and he unfortunately had to jump off of the chat, but he did say hello and wanted to wish you and your family well. And I wanted to make sure you got that message. Um, <laughs> back to and the chat. Many, many years. Yeah, yeah he's, he's, nice. an, he's an absolutely wonderful man and we, we love having him around. He's still here quite a bit. Mark uh, mentions that your descriptions of place are so real and evocative. Do you still visit and I say, like, for example, New Orleans to refresh your memory, or do the locations just live inside of you? Well, it's both. It's both. It's everywhere, though, but the, 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 the landscape of the story is in the artist, wherever he goes. Um, Hemingway talked about that. Uh, it's there. It's in, it's in the unconscious. Well, we certainly, we certainly hope that once all of this craziness is over, you'll have a chance to come back to New Orleans. Um, well, I know it's, I know it's quite a trip from it. Missoula. <laughs> um, and another question from Logan: Do you listen to music while you're writing? And if so, what yeah. music do you like? And there's a shout out to the Gov on WWOZ FM ninety two point nine Monday. <laughs> well, I like everything. All kinds of music, and I, I, I fool around with stringed instruments a little bit. You know, doors start slamming all over the house when I do that. I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no, music, music of the spheres. It's, look, to be a good writer, you have to be a good listener. It's that simple. A good writer is a good listener, and also he watches the work. He's a spectator. My father used to say that. He said, uh, science and uh, art are simply the incremental discovery of what God has already created. And he said, you're witness, Jim, to a art. You're not the creator of it. It's there. But he said, you have to listen and you have to look. He had it, he had it right. You got to listen. Well, I the wish dialogue, that it's it's the key to all good writing. The yeah. amb look, people of color, if you listen to them, use the iambic line. Listen to black people talk. Every other syllable is accentuated. It's like upbeat and downbeat. That's it. I wish my my mother who is an artist, and I I she's also. And uh, and part of she's always been on a religious journey, and um, I, I wish she had been able to hear you say that. I'll have to share uh, what your your some of your father's wisdom with her. She'll appreciate it. Patricia also uh, asks um, or comments that it seems like your characters talk to you, so you must listen to them as you write. Is that is that true? 
Yep. Uh, I was the student of Dr. John Neihart, who wrote Black Elk Speaks. Dr. Neihart was one of America's great Western poets. Also, he was a mystic. And uh, my heavens, he, uh, he was with the Greenwich Village Poets in 1905. And he was my creative writing teacher. But he used to tell me he wrote at night because these were his exact words. That's when the voices of dead poets speak to you. And he meant it. I believe it too. I believe we're completely surrounded. Another, another notion of my father's, <clears throat> Dave Rover Show talks about the possibility that time is not sequential. There is no past, present, and future. Instead, it happens. All time happens at once. The unborn are still out there. And that's why we have to be good stewards of the earth. We owe that to the people who are not born. But also, it indicates that we are not the uh, prisoners of time, that we can change the past. We can change things. We're not doomed to what we have done. You know, the doom book. It's the death book in medieval time. We do not have to accept death, but it's all in conception. It's, it's a fascinating. I mean, time, time in general is a fascinating concept. And as I've spent more time um, alone <laughs> in the past 18 months, um, uh, you know, you, you think about it and and uh, it's always nice to hear other perspectives. Susan uh, loves that you paraphrase Gerald Manley Hopkins in your acknowledgments. Um, can you talk more about that? Uh, uh, is the acknowledgement to, of, of whom? I'm, uh, I'm Susan, sorry. I didn't Susan care. loves that you paraphrase Gerald Manley Hopkins in your acknowledgments. Oh can you talk more to that? I did that in this book. The, the acknowledgments Jim, in the book. A, Jim, you have a quote from uh, Pied Beauty, Gerard Manley Hopkins' Pied Beauty. Oh, the, yeah. Blessed be God one, for all. Blessed be to God things. for all dappled things. Oh, sorry. I right. mispronounced right. the name. <laughs> Gerard Manley Hopkins. Yeah, the metaphysical poet. And he created what was called sprung rhythm. Mm -hmm. He was very conscious about the iambic foot. <laughs> but... Uh, if, any, if you want to read what the medical, if you want to see the example of the metaphysical image, get a copy and go to the public library of Gerard, the notebooks of Gerard Manley Hopkins. He wrote down these images that he would see from a train car or maybe uh, going uh, in a carriage someplace in Ireland, in the, the countryside on the moors. Anyway, that he had an incredible eye for the metaphysical, for things that it seems like this is what I feel, that there is only one experience that we can commit with God at our side. And that's when we put our hand into infinity. And that's what the artist does. It's like putting your hand in a baptismal font. It's something is changed in the world at that moment. No other person can do that. It is the artist. And this is the peculiarity. Most artists glow with neurosis. I mean, let's face it. I remember something our Hemingway said. <clears throat> Somebody asked him if he ever was in uh, analysis. He said, oh, yeah, every day, Dr. Smith Corona. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's it. And the people who just seem most undeserving of the gift are handed it by a votive hand out of nowhere. I mean, did you ever see the film about the life of um, oh, uh, Amadeus, uh, you know, Amadeus? Mozart. Yeah, Mozart. And the title of the film is Amadeus. And it's a story of this guy who's just, you know, he, 
he's just an absolute clown. Guy has this huge talent who drives Solieri crazy because Solieri works and works and works and his work is garbage compared to Amadeus's. One night at a, at a, a ball, Amade um, Amadeus, is, he had just mooned an ecclesiastical figure. <laughs> Moon. Anyway, <laughs> and so Yeri goes to him and says, oh, Amadeus, I'm so happy to see you. I have written a sonata here, and I want you to play it here tonight for me. No one else has seen it. And Amadeus takes the scored sheets, goes over to the piano, takes off his shoes, and plays Solieri's music with his toes. <laughs> and, and so, so, so Yuri declares war on God for doing this to him, giving this great gift to Amadeus. It's a great film. <laughs> Look, this is, this is what it comes down to. More as an artist, more people will discourage you than will encourage you. But why is that? Because there are people, unfortunately, who got the green-eyed monster at work in their lives. You really want to dr drive people crazy, grin and walk through the cannon smoke and drive them up the wall. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I think I needed to hear that today <laughs> for whatever reason. I'm sure that there were some other people who needed to hear that today too. Um I would love to field any other questions that anybody else might have, including you, Colette. Um so uh I don't know, Carol and Christopher, to put you on the spot. They, my um, uh, friend Carol and my husband Christopher are, have been here rearranging the bookstore. I don't know if you guys want to pop in or Christopher might want to say something. Um, Christopher we'll always come, wants we'll to say, say something. Hello. You want to just wave and say hi. They've been rearranging hello, hello. as we pass by. How are you all doing? Good. Nice doing great. You. We have been thoroughly enjoying the entire evening from the offside. It's an infectious oh. laugh you've got. <laughs> well, I wish I were with y'all. Gee whiz. Next time. Next time. Next time. Next time. Yeah. Yeah. Next yeah. time. Yeah. Um, and I, I will pay you. But it's less a question and more of a compliment. I, I've, I've, so people descend upon this bookstore because they know we have not only cop, every copy of your book ever written, uh, but also signed copies of most of them. That was a shameless plug. But um, the uh, somebody came in and said, he said it properly in a very, in, a, in almost a Cajun patois. He said, that Dave Robichaud is the only character I ever saw that I felt like he grew up next door to me and down the bayou. <laughs> And I said, you do know he's an NOPD cop most of the time, and he doesn't speak with occasion. And he says, I know. And he says, and he stopped, and he says, because neither do I, and I lost it too when I moved to New Orleans 20 years ago. <laughs> so I thought it was a really well said. That's so. a nice story. Well, you got the accent now. <laughs> yeah, he's been, he practices. Anyway, well, we love our friends of the Garden District Bookshop. And Colette, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Jim, thank you so much for being a and part of thank this. Thank you for having me. We'll see you all directly. We're going to be down there pretty soon. Good. Jim, come come say, visit. Jim, I wanted to yeah, say, well, as always, it's a pleasure. Always a delight. And yeah. I know you have, I know you have a tough interview tomorrow coming up. Yeah. with uh al affair and i wanted yeah. i asked i'd just like you to give her my best she's uh okay she's yeah yeah yeah, yeah al, it's a shame the uh the yeah, voucher con has collided with the pandemic yeah. it sure <laughs> did it sure did yeah it was so sad yeah but 
you know what, for the best, especially considering that it's going to be, it would have been in the middle of a hurricane. So <laughs> everybody, Ooh, let's thank quick. our lucky, thank our lucky stars. Um, so thank you all to all of the attendees who uh, dealt with us as we figured out Zoom webinars and to you two as <laughs> we learned more about these new virtual platforms. Uh, I truly thank you and um, I hope that everyone in town and I know that we had people as as far away as Michigan and people in Canada. I know that we had people in Europe visiting us tonight. Um, thanks so much for being here and um, this will be recorded and it will eventually be posted on our social media platforms for you to share with your friends and family. Um, everybody enjoy the book and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Mark. Well, thank, thank you all for having me. You, you did a great job. Thank you, Colette. Thank you, Appreciate Jim. it. Have a great night.